This is Patrick Russell. Uh, I'm interviewing Bob Chisholm for the first time. Uh, this interview is, is taking place in Dallas, Texas on October the 17th, 2014. Uh, this project, uh, this interview is made for the Making History Project for a project uh, entitled War and Peace, Memories from World War II. And um, Bob, why don't you first start by telling me uh, where you were born? Dallas, Texas, June the 23rd, 1925. And uh, how big was your family? Had uh, two brothers, older than I. And um, where did you go to high school? Forest Avenue High School in Dallas. And what were you doing before World War II? In school. You were still in high school? Mm -hmm. All right. And uh, you were in your senior year of high school? No, uh, I was in my uh, junior year in high school. All right, and do you remember what you were doing on Pearl Harbor Day? I do not remember what I was doing no. on Pearl Harbor Day. Okay, and um, how did you enter into the service? I uh, volunteered for the Army and uh, was accepted on uh, 27th of August. 1942. And you were 17 at the time? I was 17. I had uh, two brothers that had gone into service already, one in the Marines and one in the Army. And uh, of course a wave of patriotism had swept the country and I think it affected practically everyone. Uh, I couldn't wait to get in and I was a real pain to my family. And uh, they, so much so that they decided that they would uh, sign the papers, boost my age up, which allowed me to go in, and that's what happened. So how old uh, did they say you were? Nineteen. And um, what branch of the service did you volunteer for? When I was uh, at the recruitment station, they initially signed me to the Air Corps. And uh, for some reason, they changed that, and they sent me to Camp Walters, which was the Infantry Training Center in 1942. And I took uh, my first seven weeks of basic as an infantryman, and then I went to a common specialist school, which was a, a CW radio operator. And while I was at uh, Camp Walters, they sent a recruiting team out from Fort Benning, Georgia, paratroopers, four of them dressed in their jumpsuit, and uh, they put on an unforgettable demonstration. Uh, Jiu-jitsu and throwing each other around, kicking each other around, and uh, I said, well, that's for me. <laughs> so I signed up that day and volunteered for the Airborne, and after I completed my basic training, I uh, went to uh, Fort Benning, Georgia for the Airborne School. What about specifically the Airborne when you said, you know, that's for me, what was it? You were active in sports? Uh, I, was, uh, I was impressed by uh, the appearance and the physical condition of uh, those recruiters they sent out. Uh, I, uh, I, I was in, involved in athletics in high school and, and thought I was in pretty good shape. Uh, it just, uh, I thought, well, these, these, are the, these are the elite of the United States Army and uh, knew, of course, and that uh, I would like to be a part of that. I think we had probably about uh, uh, 17 or 18 volunteers from my uh, company, from Camp Walters, that uh, volunteered uh, that day for the organization. And later, I think we had about four or five of us that actually got through and completed the training. Four out of four? About four? A 17. Okay. 17 or 18, I don't recall the exact number, but I know that uh, I, I can still remember the names of uh, the three or four or the others that got through the training. And uh, I stayed in touch with them for quite some time. And at the time that the Airborne recruited you, do you know about how many classes already went through the Airborne? My class was class 52, I believe. So you were, you were right there, pretty much right at the beginning. And um, how was um, 
Well, when you went through basic training, how was that? Let's just before airborne. Basic training, uh, 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 physically, I had no problems. Uh, firing, I had no problems. I had uh, spent a lot of time with my grandparents in East Texas and started hunting when I was young. So I had fired rifles and shotguns, and uh, I had taken ROTC in high school. So it wasn't uh, uh, close order drill wasn't new to me. As a matter of fact, I was made an acting corporal. And uh, the best thing about that was I got out of the details. But uh, uh, basic training, uh, I, I thought, was uh, not easy, but wasn't in, in difficulty that some of the people had. And then tell me about Airborne. That took it to a whole new level? It was a different situation. So what was that all Well, about? we got down, uh, when we arrived, at the, uh, my class arrived at the parachute school, we had a uh, two-week delay until we could start the official training, and that two weeks was spent in calisthenics eight hours a day. And we would start off the day with a run, and uh, I didn't really care for that. But uh, it was uh, it was very, uh, I thought I was in good physical condition, and I found out that no, I wasn't really in good physical condition because they really put us through it. It was eight hours a day solid calisthenics. And uh, the, I think that the, uh, the instructors at that time uh, wanted, if you, if you weren't really up to par and had the qualifications to be airborne, they didn't want you there, and they tried to get rid of you. I think that was very deliberate. And uh, we dropped quite a, few, uh, quite a few out of my class right during that first two weeks. And then we went into the uh, formal aspect of the four weeks of training. and. Uh, we were in because uh, this was sort of unusual for, for a group to go in two weeks ahead of schedule. And uh, so the time we started our formal uh, four weeks of training, we were in pretty good shape then, but we would still lose some people. Uh, I remember uh, we were doing tumbling, we were tumbling off a platform in the sawdust pit. And uh, I'll never forget this, one of the students uh, uh, complained because he didn't like to get the sawdust. And the instructor says, get out of here. He was gone. So at least a little thing like that would, uh, they'd move you out. It was a weeding out process. Oh, yes. And that was, and again, that was, I think that was very deliberate that they did that. But uh, tough training. And uh, you had every reason to be proud of yourself once you made it through because the classes uh, drastically shrunk from the time uh, that they first started the training until they completed that four weeks of training. Besides the calisthenics, once you, once you passed that weeding out process and you went into your formal training, what, what did they do from there? Well, the, the, uh, the four weeks of training uh, was, uh, uh, again, you had your, uh, your first week was mainly, again, calisthenics. And uh, that included a 30-foot rope climb, climb and they had uh, the uh, bowling pins and you do exercise of the bowling pins, which was terrible because those things are heavy and you just drop down. And uh, they uh, taught tumbling. And uh, the run was always, every day the run was there. How you were far running was five, the run? You were running five miles a day then. And you run with a pack? No, no, no. No, you didn't run with anything. You just, uh, uh, we, had, uh, we had coveralls and, and uh, the regular shoes. We didn't get our jump boots until we got into sea stage. But then uh, we also at that time had uh, you got down into C stage, I believe it was C stage, and you had parachute packing, and uh, you spent, uh, uh, I think it was a four hour period in the afternoon that you pack, learned to pack a parachute. Because at that time, you packed your own parachute for your jump. These days they have riggers, and you never worry about packing a parachute. And of course you knew you were gonna jump that chute that, uh, that you were packing, so you were extra careful, and sometimes you'd even go back and say, well, did I do this? And a uh, server slow process, but you got your chute packed. And then that ended with the, uh, uh, they had a 35 foot tower that uh, you jumped from. Uh, and you lost a few men on that. Then you had the 250 foot towers that uh, you trained on. And then from that, you went into the jump stage, D stage. When you jump from the tower, what's the process? Uh, I'm sorry? 
When you're jumping from the, the 25 foot tower, what are you doing? 250 foot tower? Yeah. I'm sorry. Okay. Well, there's four chutes on the tower, and they would lift you up. And when you got to the top, your time came, it'd pull you up, and that would drop you. And then the instructors are on the ground telling you what to do. And, and uh, so that was your first experience with a parachute drop just prior to the time that you actually made the drop out of an airplane. Uh, I think that I think they adopted that from uh, from the World's Fair, or, or where they picked up those tires and brought them down, and they still have them down there at uh, Fort Benning. They still use them in the training exercise, and that gave you your first feel of actually being in the air in a parachute with nothing between you and the ground but your parachute. And of course, your instructors are yelling your instructions all the time: uh, pull to your front, slip to your left, uh, just to get you on the ground, get you the feeling there. Uh, very realistic training, very profitable training. Did you ever go into the jiu-jitsu as aspect that so impressed you? Yes. The guys roughly yes. and tumbling there was a Throughout the course, there was an hour a day. And it was, it was they, that, that, then they called it jiu-jitsu. Uh, unarmed combat, they changed the name. Uh, karate, they changed the name. But it was jiu-jitsu then. And uh, you, uh, uh, you squared off with an opponent, an opponent and you went through all the exercises, and I can remember some of those exercises today. So it was very, uh, very it's impressive. Perfection thing. through repetition, right? Yes. What um, What was your specialty in Airborne? Well, I had uh, I had gone through the common specialist school at Camp Walters, which was uh, a CW radio operator, and uh, when I graduated from the parachute school. I went right directly into the Parachute Communication School, which is at Fort Benning, right down near the jump area. And that was a continuation of uh, the uh, CW training, Continuous Wave Training, Mars Code. And uh, after I completed the school, I was uh, retained as an instructor. And uh, the reason for my retention as an instructor was that uh, the 508 was in blanding training, and the 508, of course, had no uh, communication personnel, so a group of instructors were uh, assigned, not joined, to the 508, and then when the 508 came up, that group was transferred into the 508. And that was in uh, uh, Mar January, March of uh, 43. So we were uh, we were the communication personnel, and that was my specialist, and I. Uh, continued to be in communication until uh, oh, Normandy, and then I uh, was given another job. Was the communication uh, something that you selected, or they chose that no. for you? No. They gave you an aptitude test when you entered the service, and uh, I guess that I scored well enough on the aptitude test that they thought I would, could uh, uh, adapt to the uh, Mars code and be a code operator. And I did. And um, you mentioned the 508. Is that the only group that you were associated with for your service in World War II? That was the only group I was with in World War II, yes. And um, you mentioned Normandy, so you deployed overseas. I did. All right. And how did you get overseas? We... Uh, we left in December of 43, traveled by troop ship, whole regiment, sailing out of Camp Kilburn, New Jersey, and um, we arrived in uh, Ireland, and were stationed in Ireland at uh, uh, Port Rush and Port Stewart, that was in Southern Ireland, in Northern Ireland, and uh, then we left Ireland I believe in March of 43 and traveled to England, to Nottingham, and then Nottingham was our base until uh, we made our jump into Normandy. And you, more training continued while you were in Nottingham? Absolutely. What were you doing and there? Right, and as a matter of fact, the training continued in Ireland too. And uh, that was uh, during the winter months in Ireland. A lot of rain in Ireland during the winter. Uh, I don't remember as it being too cold, and we were living in uh, uh, in a little uh, s a s 
a 12 man squad huts. There's 12 men in the squad and the 12 men were in a, a hut and uh, the uh, uh, furnishings were rather bare. Uh, the food wasn't too good. We're on English rations and uh, we, uh, we were out training in the, in the mountains and had the peat bogs and uh, it was a pretty difficult period for training. But we did a lot of training. The thing I remember most about Ireland was that the people were so darn nice. I mean, just fantastically generous people. Uh, they didn't have much as, uh, as far as ra rationing was in effect then, and the people didn't have much. But they would uh, they would share it with American soldiers. They'd invite them into their home to come in and have Sunday dinner with them, and uh, they just uh, I, I, I was really really impressed by them. I know that my mother corresponded with a family that had sort of adopted me for 20 or 30 years. Do you remember the name of that family? I don't remember the name of the family. Do you remember the town that they lived in? Uh, Port Rush. Okay. And did the focus of your training change at all once you arrived overseas? Yeah, this was advanced unit training mainly. And uh, we actually, in Ireland, we would actually go down at, to the beaches and uh, simulate uh, uh, beach landings and going up. They had, they had the little, little cliffs, not really steep cliffs. So we would be on the beach, beach and uh, just as if we had landed there uh, and then we'd have to make the assault up the little cliffs and then on into the land. So that was advanced unit training. And then after we got over to uh, England, and we didn't make any jumps, any training jumps in Ireland. And after we got to England, uh, that uh, training intensified and uh, we uh, uh, got away from the squad tactics and the platoon tactics and got into the company tactics. And uh, in England, I believe we made three jumps and uh, terrible, terrible jumps just scattered all over the area instead of hitting our drop zone. And uh, that was really a forerunner of what was going to happen to us in Normandy. We didn't know it at the time, of course, but uh, the training uh, uh, the training was uh, uh, very, very uh, difficult at that time. Very profitable training, too, I might add. Do you know why those jumps were landing all over the place? No, I don't, uh, except that uh, the, uh, the pilots that, uh, that were flying the planes uh, had to know where they were going and had to know when to release you from the planes. And uh, if they weren't exactly on target, you missed your drop zone. And uh, I, can't, uh, I can't remember that we ever hit our drop zone on a training jump in England. I mean, we were, they, they just scattered us over the countryside. But, uh, and you want to fault somebody? Yeah, well, the pilots were at fault. They were the ones that flew the plane to the objective and gave the green light for the jump. And your jump master had nothing to do with it. And if your pilots were off the mark, uh, you were off the mark too. And during this training, you were still in the communications? I was still in communications, yes. And um, can you tell me a little bit about what, what you actually did with the communications? Well, I was, uh, uh, I was a... Uh, Platoon radio operator, second platoon of I Company, and the radios that I was using at the time was uh, the, uh, uh, I believe the correct nomenclature was a PRC-6, it was a little handheld operator, and then we had, uh, it was just voice, and then we had a PRC-10 that had a greater range, and that was a voice, uh, voice only operated, it wasn't continuous, uh, continuous code. And so on the, uh, on the exercises, I would be, I was my platoon leader's radio operator, and uh, my platoon leader was Fran Mahan at the time. And so I was with him all the time, and when he had to uh, contact uh, company headquarters, then uh, his contact with company headquarters would be me through the radio. And uh, that, was, uh, that was good training too, because uh, Sometimes your radio would be, battery would be gone, you'd have to recognize that and get your battery changed, or the range would be too long. And, uh, so it was a good experience. 
while you were employed overseas, and specifically when you were in England, did you know what your eventual mission was going to be? Not at all. At we, what point uh, did you learn? Well, I learned what the specific mission was when they took us out to the airport and started briefing us. That same day? Well, the, our briefings, uh, uh, now I'm not sure if our briefings started the day that we got to the airport because we probably were getting settled in. Uh, so, <coughs> excuse me, it was a secured area and we were told you can't leave the area. Bob wire and they had guards outside. Guards had already to shoot anybody trying to get out. And uh, I think maybe the, the, uh, the second day that they started briefing us on the mission using sand tables, which had already been set up uh, in, the, in the briefing room, which uh, and it was also a secure room. They, uh, <coughs> excuse me, they uh, had the sand table set up and it showed, we knew at that time what our mission was going to be. How many people were privy to that type of briefing? Every man in your company. <clears throat> what type of uh, weapons were you qualified to use? M1 rifle, Thompson, Thompson submachine gun, 45 automatic, Browning automatic rifle. We had fired the, uh, the Martyr, 60 millimeter Martyr, familiarization. <clears throat> and uh, that was it as far as weapon qualification. And we had to be qualified with all those weapons. You would have to be familiar to be able to pick up anything you need to do. Well, of, of those of those weapons, my the weapon primary weapon that I was armed with was the M1 rifle, and I carried a 45 automatic. And uh, but I had been qualified on the BAR, the light machine gun, and familiarization with 60 millimeter mortar. And yes, you had to be familiar with those weapons in the event that uh, become necessary for you to to uh, carry one of them and fire them. And so you participated on uh, D-Day? I did. And uh, what was your rank at that time? My rank was private. Right. And can you tell me what you ended up with in your military career? Uh, retired as a lieutenant colonel. So tell me what happened on D-Day from your perspective. We left, uh, we left the air, we loaded the planes, put the bundles on the planes, loaded the planes, and I believe it was around 10.30 in the evening that we uh, took off on the runway. And we circled over, over England for maybe an hour to rendezvous with the rest of the planes in our flight. And uh, then we, uh, uh, we took off uh, for the French coast and we knew the route that we were taking. We knew we were going to uh, uh, fly over, uh, and I can't remember the name of the island that we were flying over as a landmark. And then from that island, uh, Jersey Island, was it? No, I can't remember. <clears throat> and uh, that, after we hit that landmark, then we would turn to the right and uh, fly over the French coast. Uh, we were scheduled to, to the best of my rec recollection, we were scheduled to go out uh, the plane at an altitude of about 800 feet. And as we passed over uh, uh, the Guernsey Islands, I think, as we passed over the island, we began to get a little flack. And uh, our, I, I understood that our pilots, this was their first flight in combat. And uh, when we got on the coast, we started getting a little heavier flack and the pilots, for some reason, uh, started to extend, and they, they got up above the clouds, and I had heard somebody say we were over 2,000 feet at altitude, and uh, they, uh, uh, they just uh, lost a uh, sense of direction, and uh, when we were given the green light to go out, I don't think they knew where we were or they were, because we had not had any contact with our Pathfinder team who had gone in about an hour ahead of us to set up the Pathfinder equipment to guide us in. So uh, we were out at a higher altitude and uh, when I landed I didn't have any idea where I was at. I knew I wasn't on my, on my drop zone that I'd been briefed on. 
I was in a field, the field was surrounded with hedgerows, and no one had ever told us about the hedgerows. They were just almost a, a barrier that you had to, if you couldn't find the entrance to that particular field, you just had to cut your way out. <clears throat> and um, I landed, uh, no one around me that I could see. Uh, I took my, uh, took my trench knife out and cut my harness off with my chute and uh, uh, sat there for a few minutes trying to hear if I could hear anyone, any, anyone or see anyone. I didn't. So I got through the hedgerow, walked out, and there was a, uh, a road there. And uh, I just started walking down the road. What, uh, this, what time did you drop out approximately? About 2.30. This is... This was now June 6th. So you left on June 5th. On June the 5th, yeah. You jumped June 6th. Um, what was the weather like? The weather was pretty good. It was, it was, it was fair. I know the moon was out. It yeah. was fair, and uh, I, 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 I can't recall that there was much wind to interfere with the drop or to make the drop any more hazardous. Were you concerned about the altitude? No, because I didn't really know what altitude we were at. Uh, it was later that I learned out that uh, I know we were climbing through the clouds because uh, uh, Lieutenant Mayhem, our platoon leader, number one, was already in the door, and uh, I was in the door behind him. We knew we, were, we knew that uh, there was flak coming up, hadn't hit our plane, but we could see the flak coming up, and we knew that we were we were above the clouds and we weren't near the altitude that we were supposed to jump. And I had later found out that we were over 2,000 feet, and uh, we were supposed to go out to much lower altitude. Where did you normally train at for jumping? What altitude? I think around 1,200 feet. And uh, what was the, did you have a code name for your drop zone or location where you were supposed to land? If we did, I don't remember it. And probably did. Um, from where you were, were you able to see other, um, other planes when you were flying? <clears throat> No. Uh, once we had exited the aircraft and made the jump, uh, I don't recall having seen any other planes. I might have heard them, and uh, I wasn't. Uh, I wasn't really interested. I was more interested in uh, trying to determine where I was at and if there were any of uh, uh, any of my company or, or any of my platoon around the same stick that had jumped with me. And uh, do you remember what your first objective was? Well. Uh, my first objective was trying to find somebody. <laughs> so I walked down the road. We, we Each of us were carrying a landmine, about a 30-pound landmine, and we were supposed to have taken that landmine and, and uh, after we, uh, uh, after the these, uh, after the landing zone and, and uh, consolidate the landmine so it could be used. And I know that uh, I just took mine out. About a, It's a pretty heavy landmine. I just took mine out and pulled the, the, uh, the pin out of it and laid it on the road and thought, well, the Germans, we don't have any vehicles, and the Germans come down the vehicle, they'll run into it, and that'll be fine. And then I started walking, and uh, I, heard, uh, uh, I heard a motorcycle coming down the road, and uh, I knew we didn't have any motorcycles, so I got to the side of the road, and uh, when the motorcycle came into view, it was a, it was a uh, sidecar on it, it was German, and uh, I opened up on them with my M1, and uh, apparently hit the driver, and they went off the side of the road, I didn't go back to look at them, and I kept walking, and uh, I walked right into St. Mary Glees, and, and down to the center of town, and I saw uh, John Steele hanging on the tower, thought he was dead, he wasn't, he'd been wounded, and uh, the town had already been taken by the 3rd Battalion of the O5, so uh, I stayed with uh, G Company of the O5 for the first uh, three days until uh, uh, more of our, uh, more from the regiment, the 508 came in, and then we, uh, we had a large enough group that we got together and went and joined the rest of the 508. So you made it, when you made it to St. Mary Glace, that was all by yourself? All by myself. You know how far along you walked? Uh, no, and it wasn't too, it, it must not have been more than a, a mile and uh, other than that motorcycle, I did not see anyone or, or hear anything. 
and uh, of course I walked right into the to the G Company defensive position in St. Mary Gleese. They were occupying uh, uh, German, German trenches had been dug, and uh, so they were occupying these trenches out. Uh, I guess that was south of uh, just a little bit south of the town, right on the outskirts of the town, and just. Uh, like normal conversation, well, who are you and what unit? And well, we're the third battalion of 505, and so that's fine. Were you carrying a clicker? You know what? Uh, if if uh, if they gave us the crickets, I had one, but I don't remember it, and I don't remember ever having used it. Do you have face paint on? Well, we'd taken uh, before the jump. Uh, we had uh, we had these uh, uh, pot belly stoves in the hangar uh, to keep us warm, and we just took the uh, soot off the stove and painted our faces with it because nothing was ever provided us uh, to uh, uh, to darken our faces. Not in those days, like they do today, they didn't have the paint or whatever. So you improvised. So we improvised, yet. Yeah. I know we had a steak dinner that night. In St. Mary Glaze? No, no. At the airport before oh, we jumped. Okay. <laughs> they bought us they bought a great familial that night, steak dinner, and they brought in just, just cases of cigarettes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I I think I took a carton of lucky strikes and broke them in half and put them in my jump pocket and I, man, all those cigarettes coming in, what are they gonna do with them? Good treatment that night. What happened after Saint Mary Glace? Well, uh, we got back to uh, got back to the 508, and uh, joined my company, and uh, then we uh, 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 went into uh, uh, the uh, action that our uh, uh, battalion uh, had been assigned, and uh, it's it's all. Uh, I know we made a river crossing. And uh, the third battalion did, and we were in several firefights, and uh, we uh, we had participated in the uh, the Pierre Causeway, not the original assault, but after the Causeway had been taken, we then passed through an attack to continue the attack, and uh, we did so, and we took our objective. Now, this is this is the regiment, the battalion. Which Causeway was that? The Lafiere Causeway. Uh, that little bridge. Oh yeah, yeah. Uh, just a well. Now this that was, was important. Yeah, for... this was this is a complete causeway across the uh, the, uh, the the river there, and uh, they uh, uh, the units that made the initial attack really took some heavy casualties. That's where the Iron Mike is today, right? Yeah. And uh, then uh, our our uh, regular missions continued. And on the 23rd of June, uh, they had a combat patrol going out. And Lieutenant Harn, second lieutenant, uh, platoon leader of the first platoon of Company I-508, was a patrol leader. And uh, we were to make contact with the enemy to try to determine where their positions were. And uh, I uh, was a point man on the patrol with uh, Bill Hughes uh, from my company. And we were um, going down a road. The road made a bend. And while we were walking on the road, I'll never figure out. It's not something I'd ever done later. Where but, was this again? Pardon? Where was this? And, and uh, it was, uh, uh, I, I, I cannot uh, remember the, it was in, uh, uh, not too far from St. Mary Lisa, I know. Or, but I can't remember exactly the uh, uh, the names of the terrain around there. I think we were I think we were going to we were trying to we were getting ready to make an attack on the fourth of July, and we were trying to find out before we did this where the enemy positions were. So that was the reason for the combat patrol rather than a reconnaissance patrol. And I, I, I remember it was Hill 131 or uh, Hill. It was one of the hills there. And I just can't, I can't recall it. But uh, as we came to that bend in the road, 
a machine gun opened up and got me in my right shoulder, knocked me in the ditch, and then got me in the back of the head. And uh, Bill Hughes, my good friend, jumped in the ditch on the other side of the road and uh, he kept yelling, Bob, Bob, are you all right? And every time he'd yell, Bob, are you all right? That machine gun opened up again. It was just clipping, just low enough, it just got the top of my head. And uh, he said, uh, uh, and they had, a, uh, had an armored car there, and the armored car backed out because I guess they thought they were going to be attacked by a, a greater force. The machine gun was there, and Bill, uh, Bill jumped up and he had a Thompson submachine gun, and uh, I had a BAR, and uh, he knocked out that machine gun nest with that Thompson submachine gun. And we got up and went back down the road and uh, ran into uh, the rest of the patrol. And they had, we had accomplished our mission. We found what the enemy position was. And so we went back, uh, back to the regiment and I went into the, uh, to the uh, battalion first aid station. And our battalion, our regimental surgeon uh, looked at my wounds and uh, dressed the one on my uh, arm and also on the back of my head and they evacuated me back to a medical station and uh, then from there uh, on a boat over to England and uh, in the hospital in England. And I stayed in the hospital until uh, end of August and uh, they were going to send me to uh, uh, an infantry unit and uh, no I'm not going to an infantry unit and I left and went back to the 508 I knew where they were and I think they carried me to all at the hospital for a few days but I was back with the unit and that was the important thing so that was uh, that uh, the, and the 23rd of June happened to be my 19th birthday that's when you got hit that's when I got hit that's when you got your first combat infantry badge? No, that's when I got my first Purple Heart. Okay. Well, how did you get your first combat infantry badge? Well, everyone that had participated in the Normandy campaign and that otherwise qualified got the combat infantry badge. Now, I don't know the exact date that that was published in orders or I know it was math way back out of Normandy. Or, and I, I do have uh, probably the general order number in which that was uh, awarded. <clears throat> Now you have the the great distinction of being one of the few to have three combat infantry. I do badges, have yes. Correct? That's a combat infantry badge with two stars. And that came from your experience in Korea and, and Vietnam. In Vietnam mm -hmm. and in Normandy. In Normandy. Mm -hmm. And there's less than was what was the number? Three hundred and twenty five or three forty five? You know better than me. Uh, you the know, history of the U.S. Army, it's yeah, very few. Uh, uh, I'm not sure. It, it, uh, it was less than 400 that's been awarded uh, nationwide. And, uh, of course, I guess there will be no more, no additional stars awarded for it. That third award is about the, the highest you get. And I think there's now, I believe I heard a figure there's 135 of us, maybe, uh, still alive that was awarded the, the three badges. And um, you mentioned uh, Mr. Hughes. You still Bill keep, Hughes. Yeah, mm -hmm. You still keep mm -hmm. in contact with him? or No, Bill, Bill passed away year, 10 or 12 years ago. I was in contact with his son and uh, right after uh, we maintained contact but right after he passed away, I, uh, I wrote his son and told him that his dad was a real hero, although he hadn't been recognized uh, for what he did. He would have probably have gotten as a minimum a bronze star. But back in those days, uh, and especially in, uh, in an airborne unit, uh, when somebody did something like that, you thought, well, what the heck, that's what they're supposed to do. And uh, many, many uh, of our troopers uh, participated in action that they should have been given an award, but uh, they just never were. Now, you mentioned that you trained to be a radio operator, and now you were a point man on that patrol. Yeah. How did that happen? Well, uh, the, uh, my platoon leader thought that I would be a, a better rifleman in the rifle squad 
than a radio operator. So he just he had to got him a new operator, and I went into I went into a, a squad and was an assistant squad leader. And uh, from that point on, I stayed uh, in the squad and in the platoon, and I didn't get back uh, uh, back into communications uh, at all. When did you receive your first promotion? Well, now I had been, I had been, uh, I had been promoted before. I had been, uh, I've been I, at Camp McCall. Uh, I was promoted to a T five, which was a technician fifth grade, and then I was promoted to a T four. And uh, this is a this is a real story. And uh, at Camp McCall, we had a, uh, a battalion uh, latrine. And on payday, a group of us got in, it happened never payday, a group of us got in a train, we sit up all night uh, shooting dice, drinking beer, and we left it a mess. And our battalion commander uh, was the officer of the day, staff officer of the day, and when he came down inspecting the area, he saw that mess in the latrine, and he called a battalion formation and said, uh, Okay, any of you that participated in that mess and out of the train last night, I want you to be honorable and step forward. And we had some first sergeants that had been in there that night. And uh, so being a little bit dumb at that time, a few of us stepped forward, and Colonel Mendez, finest commander I ever served under, said, well, all of you are now privates. <laughs> so uh, I, got, I, I just got promoted to T4 and I got demoted. And... Uh, so my next uh, my next promotion came in Holland, and uh, I was a corporal. And uh, then in the bulge, I was promoted to sergeant, and then uh, I was returned uh, to the states for hospitalization, and uh, promoted to uh, uh, the staff sergeant, tech sergeant. I was an instructor again at the parachute school, and uh, in nineteen. 51, I was given a direct appointment as a second lieutenant. Uh, my grade was master sergeant at the time. And uh, they had a provision at that time that uh, if you were a master sergeant and recommended by a general officer, they could give you a direct appointment as an officer and you didn't have to go to OCS or be an ROTC graduate to get it. And uh, my uh, senior advisor out in California at the time, we were advising reserve units, uh, said, did you ever think about going to OCS? And I said, no, I never gave it, gave it a thought, Colonel. He said, well, you know, we can, we can uh, probably get you an appointment as a direct appointment as a second lieutenant. And uh, I talked over to my wife, and she said, well, you know, what, what, what? So I appeared, General Wiedemeyer, 6th Army Commander, recommended me. I appeared before the board, and I was, uh, given a reserve commission as a second lieutenant, called to active duty in 1952. So when you returned back to your buddies in August of 44, after your stay, you recouped, um, where'd you go next? Well, uh, we were training. We were, uh, let's see, uh, we were at Nottingham still. Yeah, we were at Nottingham still. And uh, we uh, uh, were training, uh, the normal training that the unit does. And uh, then we were alerted for uh, Operation Market Garden. And that was a September the 17th. We were taken out to the airfield and uh, put in a secure compound. Again, uh, you can't go out and been briefed with the sand tables, and uh, we uh, uh, loaded the planes. That was Sunday, the September the 17th, beautiful day, and we made the, made the jump into Holland Market Garden. I think we went out of the plane about 2.17 in the afternoon, a Sunday afternoon, perfect landing on the DZs, nothing like Normandy, and uh, it was just a, it was a fantastic combat jump. Uh, we, uh, my platoon 
had been given a mission for recon patrol into Nijmegen, and a second lieutenant Bush uh, was the uh, assistant platoon leader, and he was the uh, patrol leader. And uh, it was uh, Joe Petrie, myself, and Bill Hughes again on the patrol. And uh, our orders were as a recon patrol that we were we were to go into Nijmegen to see how close we could get to the bridge. And uh, we, without contacting any uh, any Germans, we went into Nijmegen, got right up to the approaches to the bridge, and there was a, a circle right before the bridge, and in the middle of the circle was an 88 with uh, several Germans there. And so all we were supposed to do was see how close we could get and make a report back to uh, uh, regiment. And uh, Lieutenant Bush made the report back to the regiment. Uh, G Company was on their way up. Captain Wild was a G Company commander. And we met them, we told them what we had seen, and then uh, we went back and joined the company because our, our mission for that day had been completed. And at that point, what was your rank? Uh, at that point, I was a corporal. And what were you thinking when you saw an 88? Um, didn't give it, uh, uh, we, knew that, we knew that the 88 was a very dangerous weapon, had a lot of capability, you know, anti-aircraft, direct fire, uh, very high velocity round. And uh, it was just, a, well, hey, here's the enemy. They got an 88, and anybody that's coming up here is going to have to contend with it before they can get on the bridge. And it was pointing down, right? Uh, yeah, it was pointing right back down the street. And it was there to either deal with infantry or tanks? Any, anybody, anything coming up, probably more uh, anti-tank than anything else. But it was just a, it was just a common uh, defensive procedure that you would expect there. The, uh, the bridge had to be guarded, and this was part of the detachment there that was guarding the bridge. And so, when you did Operation Market Your Garden, that was your second combat jump? That was my second combat jump. And was there any, you feel any different jump in the second time? Well, it, uh, it, was, a, it, was, a, it was a beautiful jump. Uh, and we landed on our LZ, uh, just so greatly different from the Normandy jump, which was at night, and they just spread us over. We didn't know where we was at. And when we jumped in Market Garden, we knew exactly where we were at. We were right on our DZ. We knew exactly what we uh, what we did, what we had to do. My plane had been hit, and uh, Lieutenant Wicks in front of me, and I don't know to this day what happened to him. I'd been hit in the face, and uh, in the body with a flak. Uh, and on the way out, uh, they had a Dutch hospital in Bergendahl, and I just, we just Lieutenant Bush says, "Let's stop here right quick," and went in, and they. Put a couple of stitches in my forehead, patched me up, and we went right on our mission without uh, any great delay. Uh, but it was a, it was a uh, it was just a real nice jump or combat jump. Probably one up to that time, probably one of the best that had been made. You know, we had Africa and Sicily and Italy, and they had the same problem getting the troops all spread out. And of course, going into Sicily, some of them had been shot down by. Our Navy, and uh, but uh, and uh, we uh, uh, I guess we took the Germans completely by surprise. Also, we knew that uh, our intelligence knew and the Dutch underground knew that up at Arnhem, that uh, the Germans were refitting their panders up there, <coughs> and of course, historically later you found out that uh, Montgomery ignored that information both from. American, American intelligence and uh, Dutch underground, and so that was a bridge too far, you know, Arnhem. <coughs> Did you participate in any other activity in uh, in Operation Market Garden after your reconnaissance? Uh, yes, uh, we had uh, our company had uh, uh, a mission of setting up a roadblock in Beek. Now, Beek was right on the German border, and part of the town was in Germany, and part of the town was in Holland. And uh, our objective was to uh, uh, 
initially to go down and set up a roadblock reinforced by engineers and uh, uh, 87 millimeter and a tank gun. Uh, we got down and put our first roadblock in. On the way down, uh, we had uh, uh, we were delayed by some armored cars, and we got the armored cars out, uh, two of them, and set up a roadblock. And uh, the uh, uh, the Germans uh, uh, launched a, a small counterattack, and uh, the the troops that were there. Uh, had to pull back, and then we were given the orders to attack again, go down, attack again, get back down in town, and set up a roadblock. Uh, we did so, and uh, we had the uh, we had an engineer platoon with us and the 187 millimeter tank gun, and uh, the uh, uh, the Germans then launched a major attack on our positions. And uh, uh, or one of our we had two lieutenants with us. One of us, one of them, Lieutenant Tinker, I believe his name was, was killed. Uh, tree burst it hit, uh, and it hit, killed him in the foxhole with a radio operator. And the other officer, and uh, uh, I just uh, would say that probably not for publication. Uh, he was last seen leaving, going up a hill without his weapon. And. Uh, I took command of the operation, and uh, when I found out that we, the Germans were attacking with uh, with uh, tanks, armor, and a good sized force, and uh, I pulled our I pulled our force back to the high ground, uh, just outside of Beek, and set up defensive position there just to try to stop them from going any further. And I called, talked to Colonel Mendez, our battalion commander on the phone and he says, what do you, how, how large a force do you think that is, uh, Chisholm? And I said, well, Colonel, it looks to me like there's a, uh, at least a battalion of armor and maybe a battalion of infantry coming at us. And I think I had 187 men or 87 men, real, real small unit. He says, well, you maintain your position and we're going to try to uh, attack. And he attacked with two companies they couldn't get in. He finally committed over battalion to get back in there. And later we wondered, well, why are the Germans, why are they so hot to get back in this little town? Well, we were occupying Germany. We were the first American unit to occupy German territory. And uh, I guess the German didn't want anybody on their homeland, and they were, they were determined to get us out of there. And, and uh, uh, but. Uh, we finally took the town back and then we held it. Beak. Beak, Holland. And what happened after that? Well, we, uh, we continued, uh, we, we uh, uh, had uh, uh, operations, we would attack some positions, uh, battalion size attack, and our company's objective, and we managed to take those without any problem. Uh, we executed patrols and uh, uh, pretty much, uh, of course, uh, the, the, uh, the British and Arnhem was getting wiped out and we uh, maintained a, a route for them, the ones that could get out and get back. And so uh, that pretty much ended the operation. We stayed in Holland for, in Holland for I think, 62 days and uh, we finally uh, finally pulled back and went, we were then to Camp Sisson in France, pulled back and went back into Camp Sisson. <clears throat> what was your next operation? The next the operation, the next operation was the bulge. And how did that all start? Uh, For you? Well, uh, we got, uh, we got the, the alert order It was December, 17th, I believe, 16th. We got the alert order that the Germans had attacked and made some deep penetrations, and the 82nd Airborne was going to be committed, and uh, that was a uh, that was an overnight alert. They sent these big trucks down, big semi trucks, open trailers, and they loaded us into the trucks, 
and we were we were immediately dispatched into Belgium, and uh, we had no winter clothing. Uh, part of, and, and just uh, uh, we were actually well prepared because of the fact that we had our arms and ammunition, but uh, we got off the trucks uh, in Belgium, I think around uh, Stavelot, and. Uh, uh, just immediately went into contact with the Germans fighting, and uh, that uh, that continued right up. Uh, I know Christmas Day, we had orders to uh, pull back and uh, uh, straighten out our lines. Uh, I think General Gavin called it a street. We said the eighty second never retreated. I think he called it a strategic withdrawal or straighten the lines out. And he would take exception to anybody who said the 82nd ever retreated, as, as did we all. And uh, I know that uh, we had pulled back uh, on uh, the day after Christmas. They brought up food to us and we didn't have any utensils to eat out and we'd take our steel helmet off and they'd put the, ch the turkey and dress in everything in the steel helmet, so we was glad to get it. And then uh, we uh, were given the, given the uh, order to counterattack, and uh, we uh, had uh, had ridge, the ridge Tier de Mont was a high ground that we had left behind when we withdrew, and so we had to take that high ground again, and the 3rd Battalion had the objective of uh, leading the attack, G Company and H Company, and I Company was uh, in reserve, and we got up to the ridge, close to the ridge. We had orders to then to attack through G and H Company because they were hitting a lot of casualties. And that was on the seventh of January, and uh, uh, a tree burst uh, got me on the seventh of January, and uh, got, tore all the muscle out of my left leg and hit me in the neck and uh, freezing cold. I had never been more miserable in my life as I was in the Battle of Budge, and everybody else would say the same thing. Just, we had no equipment. We had no winter, no winter clothing at all. Uh, uh, no, uh, no, winter, no winter boots or anything. And uh, so I was, uh, I was wounded, and uh, was out most of the day. Uh, the, the, the Wiley, our medic, came by and gave me a shot of morphine, and he left the, as he was required to, he left the morphine there, let him know that I had a shot of morphine. And he put a bandage on my neck, but he didn't know that I was wounded in my, uh, my uh, leg. And uh, they later said that uh, my blood congealed and froze because of the real cold weather, and had it not, I'd probably bled to death because I was out there for several hours before they got me back to the aid station. So they got me back to aid station and they found the wound and they evacuated me to the Eighth General Hospital in Paris. And uh, I was, uh, that was a hundred dollar wound. Got me back to the States. So. Million dollar wound. Million dollar wound, yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> and I was sent back to the uh, William Beaumont Hospital in El Paso. That was a, that was a, a plastic surgery center of the military then. They'd, these uh, young men that had been in tanks had been burned, just horribly disfigured, and they would they were taking a, a skin growth out from under the arm and putting it in the ear or their nose and getting that skin growing. And then they would clip it off and then reform their nose and skin, and it just had, had an awful lot of them in there. But uh, they did the work on my face, and after after my surgery, they'd give me a, a leave seven day leave to go home. My home is in Dallas. So I take the seven day leave and go home and then come back and they do some more surgery on my face and I went down to uh, uh, when I when they had finished with the surgery there they sent me to uh, Brook Army Hospital in San Antonio uh, for roof recuperation and uh, they lost my records as they were shipping me back to the states and. Uh, I, on my leave, I'd go home, my brothers would be there, my friends would be there, they'd be out uh, drawing their $22 and drinking beer, and, and uh, I thought, oh, geez, what a heck of a life that is. 
So when the, five, the 508 was going to stay in Europe as Eisenhower's honor guard, and uh, Colonel Mendez at the time was temporarily in command, and I wrote Colonel Mendez a letter and said if I could come back to the 508, I would re-enlist in the Army. And he wrote the Army commander and uh, said, re-enlist Sergeant Chisholm for assignment back to the 508. And they did so, and I went back to the 508 and was with them in Germany for the occupation. And I had gotten married to my childhood sweetheart. And, uh, What's she, her name? Margaret Browning. Uh, when I was uh, in the second grade, she was in the first grade. I was seven, she was six. And that was uh, uh, just a long time love affair. But uh, so I went back to the, went back to the 508, uh, General Eisenhower's honor guard, tech sergeant then. And uh, Margaret and uh, other wives were the first wives allowed to come to Germany during the first dependents allowed to come to Germany to live during the occupation. And at that time, the five boy was in Hedernheim, right outside of Frankfurt. Uh, Hedernheim had been uh, quarters for the German Air Force. Uh, nice, nice little homes there. And when the five boy, uh, before the five boy moved in, the military government gave them the German Air Force people orders, take what you can take with you in one day and get out of those buildings. And so the 508 was then built in there, real nice buildings. And uh, when the uh, when uh, our wives came over, we also had quarters there. So uh, uh, I stayed with the uh, 508 until they were sent back to the states for deactivation. And at the time, they gave us uh, those of us that had uh, our wives there. We were given an opportunity to remain there in a new unit. And uh, they, had a, they had a signal group there, and my signal background or communication background, uh, they uh, agreed to take those of us that were communication qualified, 3118 signal group, I think it was the company, uh, the battalion. So uh, I then got back into signal. Um, we had uh, just an interesting point. We had, I was a tech sergeant. And at the time, the officers that had uh, served, that got out of the service, they were allowed to come back in as master sergeants. And so that pretty much froze the rank of master sergeant for enlisted men. And uh, we were putting on a signal corps display in Heidelberg for the command, the Army command, you know, showing what we had in case something came up and they needed uh, all the types of communication. And General Mateko was the... Uh, uh, New York Command Signal Officer, Major General. And at that time, General Taylor was uh, Chief of Staff. And uh, he was there, and he came down to uh, make a visit and make an inspection. You know, it was just a courtesy thing. And when he came up, uh, and he started talking to me. He says, I see you're airborne, Sergeant. And I said, yes, sir. And he asked what unit I was in and so forth. And I told him, he says, well, why are you still a tech sergeant? And I said, uh, well, sir, uh, uh, promotions were listed men are frozen now. And he turned to General Mateka and he said, uh, Mateka, can't you get this sergeant promoted? He left. Two weeks later, uh, my commanding officer received a letter that said, send Sergeant Chisholm up to Heidelberg. And uh, he's going to appear before board. And uh, I went to Heidelberg. They, they briefed me and said, you're going to appear before board officers for consideration of promotion. Said, my goodness, what is happening? And so I appeared before the board, and uh, I, uh, two weeks later, I got orders promoting me to permanent master sergeant, signed by Clarence R. Hubner, commanding general of the European Command, and I still got that certificate and those promotion orders in a, in a frame. That's awesome. Uh, yeah, it was awesome at the time. I thought, boy, I just, the right place at the right time. So that that uh, that was just an interesting point in my career. While you were there in the occupation, what was Frankfurt like? Uh, pretty much destroyed, for one thing, and you uh, you have to give the Germans credit. Very industrious. 
they would start out with a pile of rubbish and uh, they would start moving this pile of rubbish back here and the good stuff they were taking out and they were building a new structure there. Very, and uh, really impressive that they would do something like this. Uh, but uh, uh, we had, uh, of course, uh, uh, it was occupation and uh, there were restrictions. You weren't supposed to, of course I was married, but you weren't supposed, our soldiers were not supposed to fraternize with the German girls which they did, <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it was under uh, military government control, occupied, and I know that uh, uh, we would get, uh, in the 508, we would get the word that a uh, shot had been fired in some part of town, and we would immediately dispatch a uh, unit to that area and uh, conduct a search, and uh, we would often uh, uh, when we were making a search, find a weapon. If we did, we'd arrest the whole family and take them in. But we had very few of those incidents. I, I know we had we had uh, we had one or two where we had to go out and conduct the searches. Uh, just another interesting point that uh, the 508 was in Frankfurt, and uh, of course uh, uh, they had the military company, military police detachments, and uh, you know the the troopers are pretty they're proud for one thing. And uh, there's also always some kind of uh, altercation going on. So uh, the commanding general of the Franklin subpost decided, well, the best way to put a stop to this, we'll, we'll let the uh, 508 have a shoot patrol, and we'll put a shoot patrol, that's, that's a paratrooper with a CP on him like an MP, we'll put a shoot patrol with HMP, and then something happens, they'll be together there, and they can take it. And that worked very well. So that's just an interesting sidelight. Did you ever have occasion to interact with any of the German civilians? Well, we came in. Uh, uh, we came in. Con we came in contact with them. Like uh, uh, we had a maid, German maid that uh, uh, took care of our, took care of our quarters because I was I was, I was married. And uh, other than uh, other than that, I didn't have uh, uh, too much contact with the Germans then. During um, your campaign in, in, from Normandy, Market Garden, the Ardennes, did you ever have any interaction with any civilians from those countries at all? Uh, in, in Holland we did. Uh, the, uh, the Dutch people were just fantastic. Uh, you could have, uh, you, you couldn't find any uh, people more appreciative they were than the Dutch that we were there, and uh, the uh, the contact with them was just a social contact. Uh, and then, of course, with the military, with the underground, we had contact with them, but uh, that was a, a very pleasant experience. And to this day, I think the Dutch is, the Dutch people are more friendly toward America than maybe any other European country. Do you recall any specific interactions with anybody from Holland? No. Um, what about with um, any of the German soldiers? Do you ever have any interaction with them? No. And what kind of awards did you receive during World War II? I um, received a Legion of Merit. Bronze Star, Three Purple Hearts, Combat Entrance Badge, and then the normal campaign medals, uh, European Campaign, Native American, and uh, then the uh, foreign decorations uh, that the uh, regiment received, and the individuals received, the uh, French Fort Gare, Belgian Fort Gare, and the Dutch Orange Lantern, and uh, that was it. And what was the Bronze Star for? Bronze Star was for meritorious service. Purple Heart for wounds. Mm -hmm. uh, Legion of Merit for the action in Holland. Was there a specific um, action or event that led to the Bronze Star? No. Uh, the fact that you were in the infantry and been awarded the Common Instrument Badge entitled you to the Bronze Star for meritorious service.
Have you ever heard of the phrase that war is hell? Yes, I have. You agree with that? I agree with that. How so? What What was your experience that you would agree with that statement? Well, uh, my uh, the, the experience that leads me to say that more than anything is the fact that uh, uh, those soldiers that you served with uh, and became, uh, uh, you're not blood brothers, but you really are become brothers, there is no closer relationship than serving with a man in combat. And... Uh, when you see them killed, it's just devastating. You don't ever forget it. And uh, there's nothing more, no, nothing more horrible than to lose so many of your friends in, uh, uh, in a conflict that, uh, you know, was, well, was it worth it? Yeah, I guess it was. If we hadn't gone into the conflict, uh, we might be living in an entirely different world now. But, uh, and uh, it's, it's just something that, something that you'll never, ever forget. Uh, I, uh, uh, I, can, I, can, I, can very, I can very distinctly remember uh, each action in which my closest friends were killed. And then uh, uh, when I wasn't there, like in Normandy, uh, after I was hospital, I came back and I walked into the orderly room and I see a company clerk sitting there, and I sign in, and I say, uh, uh, introduce myself. Don't know him, he's new replacement. And uh, I said, well, where's the first sergeant? He says, first sergeant was killed in Normandy. Uh, then you get, in, get down into your company, and you're looking around, and you don't recognize a lot of people. And, uh, you start asking about them, and you find out that uh, they were killed too. Uh, so there's nothing good about a war. Uh, it, uh, an armed conflict uh, certainly is necessary at times. If, if we hadn't fought and defeated Germany and Japan, Japan, where would we be today? You know, we don't know. Uh, and uh, of course, uh, uh, I think I think World War II was justified. Uh, I didn't like the way that Korea went. We fought under the United Nations, United Nations flag, and we should have uh, we should have won that war. We're we're still at war with Korea. I mean that's that's a that's a truce. We're still at war with Korea, and I think it's one of the one of the greater threats we have in the country today because those those people. You never, you know, when they said, well, uh, they kept talking, well, we're going to attack south, and nobody believed them, and they did. And this guy now, well, they hadn't seen him for a while. This guy now says, well, we're developing an atomic bomb. We're going to drop the bomb on you. And and you'll never know when the guy will do it. He's, he's he, that's the type of person he is. But uh, it, uh, I think it affects most everybody that's, that's, uh, some more than others is PTSD now that they've got uh, in World War II they called it uh, shell shock. Uh, I remember Ball in Texas out on a roadblock and all at once he went berserk and uh, in my company and I said, my God, what has happened to him? And he leaves and you never see him again, you never hear or heard of him again. And, uh, uh, but uh, there, was, there was more reluctance in World War II if something like that happened to you, you might end up getting court-martialed. And uh, I know that he must have been some, some, had some disciplinary action against him. So in World War II, uh, the people were very reluctant to uh, let on that, that they were bothered by something, although it, it, it would happen in very isolated cases. And then uh, uh, in Korea, uh, there was a little less stigma attached to it. And uh, they, they, at that time, they weren't court-martialing uh, a person for going into shell shock and, or, or the, the term that they used. And of course, uh, uh, in Vietnam, with Agent Orange and everything, it began to be worse. And then right now, uh, practically everybody that's coming back, these kids are 
go in for uh, uh, maybe six deployments, seven deployments, and you think, my God, how terrible that is, and their family, and and uh, you see uh, uh, one of our one of our young members in our Benavides chapter, Omar Hernandez, six deployments, wife and young kid, now they're divorced, and uh, so. Things, the situation changes uh, as the years go on, but yeah, war is hell. <clears throat> Did you ever have personal experiences of madness or terror or fear, or just uncontrollable emotions? <clears throat> well, I don't, I, I don't think I ever had uh, uncontrollable fear. Uh, I certainly have had fear uh, when you're. Well, I think the best example I can give you is uh, after having been wounded uh, three times in World War II, and then uh, I'm going to Korea, and uh, I'm, a, I'm an infantry officer, and uh, I uh, get into my unit for the first time, and I'm thinking, uh, how am I going to react? Now, this is the first time I've been back in combat since World War II, and at the end of World War II, after after being wounded three times, I wondered if I could make it if I went back in again. And so uh, I had to find out. So the first thing I did was volunteer for a patrol, in a combat patrol at night. I said, well, I'll, I'm gonna find out right now if I'm gonna be okay. And uh, sure enough, I was. It, uh, did it bother me? Yeah. Well, I'll tell you, I'm, I'm a heck of a lot more alert now than I was then, and just about every little thing. And I. I'm well trained, I'm an experienced combat man, and I know what to look for, and I would know how to react if something happened, but I, I had to prove to myself that I was going to be all right, and I found out, yes, I'm going to be all right. <clears throat> In your opinion, you didn't feel that too many people could exhibit that type of a problem during the service of World War II because of the fear of being court-martialed? Uh, what about... Ostracized. Uh, what about uh, afterwards? What about when they got home? I don't know. Uh, I don't... Because uh, 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 nowadays you hear a lot of the returned soldiers coming home and having problems. Uh, yes, they are. Do you think that your generation had a similar type of adjustment period or problems? I think, the, uh, let me, the big difference, in World War II, you went into the service, you knew you were going to be in there until the war ended. Uh, and if you were, uh, uh, let's say, you're a paratrooper, and uh, you're in combat, and uh, you're, you're, uh, you know that you're going to stay there until either you're killed or you're wounded to seriously enough that you're evacuated back to the states, and uh, it's a, it's a, it's not a it's not a, a matter of uh, you being here for six months, going back to states, coming back for six months, and uh, uh, so uh, it it, do, it didn't have the same effect on the soldiers then that was apparent that it has on them now because now. A man can go into the Middle East and spend a year there and come back and go back into the Middle East again and spend another year there and then go six months else and spend a, this continuous deployment into combat situation back to his family, back into a combat situation again. So it's an entirely different, uh, different aspect between World War II and then the situation of the Middle East today. Uh, I don't recall having a, a conversation with any of my friends, and I stayed in the military and a lot of friends and maintained contact with my friends in the, in the 82nd Airborne Division Association, and I don't recall uh, having, uh, uh, having discussed this at any length with anyone shortly after World War II. Now, uh, here, uh, are in, in the uh, in the reunions that we have, uh, you get a little more information on how how the people felt back then. Uh, they're they're able to ventilate their emotions a little more because uh, it, in World War II, there's no way 
that a man is going to admit that he's being shell shocked or he's being fearful of being uh, going in and fighting the enemy again, that uh, it, it, whether he was or he wasn't, it just didn't happen. What about today for you? How did you feel when you got back? Well, of course, I'm a veteran of three wars, and uh, uh, I uh, uh, I came out of Korea without uh, without any problem, and uh, came out of Vietnam. I came out of Vietnam bitter. I came out of Vietnam bitter because uh, I thought that our politicians and a part of our American public uh, uh, really gave that war to the enemy, and I still think that way today. I think had the American public not been demonstrating out in Hyde Ashbury and other places, and that if our politicians had uh, had decided to uh, commit forces to win that uh, action, we could have done so. And I think that uh, I think that the North Vietnamese after after uh, uh, after tech, the North, North Vietnamese uh, commander said that that you had us beat then. And it's in his book. He said, you had us beat then, but when we saw how the Americans were continuing to demonstrate, we said, oh well, we'll win this war. But uh, now, uh, I, I feel very bad for our, our young people. Uh, I don't know that uh, uh, these uh, uh, these people in the Middle East, and especially in Afghanistan, where they have the tribes, they've been fighting this for a thousand years, and they're probably going to continue to fight it. And uh, we're just not, uh, uh, we're not prepared to commit the forces necessary to uh, win the war, even if it's winnable. And again, it's because of the, the tribal factions that's involved. Uh, I, uh, my personal opinion, is that we made a serious mistake when we pulled our forces out of Iran and uh, or out of Iraq. Uh, I think we're making making the same mistake uh, in Afghanistan if we decide to pull all our forces out there, and I don't know that we will, although the president has said that we will. But uh, it's really a uh, it's it's really a mess. When you said earlier that being a combat veteran of three wars that you're more alert to things and more attuned from all your training, um, hyper vigilant, is there did you bring any of that kind of habits back home? You know, I've interviewed some veterans that have told me about, you know, they look on the ground for landmines and even to this day, seventy years later. Have you had? Have no. you noticed any of those type of things? No. no. Uh, my wife might have noticed some after. Of course, she was, uh, we were married right after World War II, and so she was a, a veteran widow for Korea and Vietnam. But uh, if she did, she never let on about it. But. Uh, I think the greatest asset a military military man has is his wife. They're just uh, they're just wonderful people, and no one gives a military wife the credit that they're due. Uh, but uh, you, you get uh, uh, I don't you, I don't you never get used to uh, being in combat and, and be under the threat of death. Uh, you have to learn to live with it. Uh, especially if you're in a leadership position. Uh, Did you have to make any type of adjustments when you got back? Uh, I don't know. Uh, I don't. Uh, I don't recall that uh, uh, that there were any uh, any adjustments necessary. I just uh, picked up and kept on living and. And uh, uh, of course, doing the, in the military, doing the things that I was supposed to do. When I when I was sent to uh, Korea, I went over there as a uh, second lieutenant. And uh, right after we were supposed, we were scheduled to go. That uh, initially, 
into the 187th in Japan. There were a plane of a plane load of us. Second lieutenant, I think, had eight nurses and one captain on. And then pork chop happened in Korea with the Seventh Division, and so they diverted all of us lieutenants into the Seventh Division. And uh, when uh, Colonel Eddie Dolman was the commanding officer, and when I got there, uh, uh, the second lieutenant, and uh, I guess Colonel Dolman looked at my record, and he needed a uh, company commander. And so he gave me a company as a second lieutenant, uh, and uh, you know it's quite a quite an accomplishment, I guess. Anyway, uh, uh, I, I kept the company until uh, my company fought the last major action of the Korean War uh, on Westview and Dale, the Chinese attack, and uh, I had a battlefield promotion to first lieutenant. Pretty, it's a uh, pretty standard, uh, I retired medically after 29 and a half years, medical retirement. On the opposite side of war being hell, there's also, you know, the, the famous book War and Peace. Mm -hmm. So then you have a peace side, and you've been, you know, deployed three different wars, and they all were different. Mm -hmm. Did you ever have experiences as a, as a military man seeing in all the chaos of war some sort of a peace, whether it was a, a civilian going out of the way to help a soldier, a um, colleague of yours going out of his way to help somebody, civilian or comrade, something that was out of the ordinary, something memorable that, that you thought, wow, this is like really unusual, but it's actually something good happening during war. Did you ever see anything like that? Well, the military pretty much takes care of their own. And uh, if, um, uh, if an incident happens in the military, uh, let's say that uh, uh, an individual is killed and uh, they're on active duty and in the military, the, uh, they, they immediately uh, move to take care of that family and make sure that that family is taken care of. Uh, that was true back in uh, World War II to the extent that they are able to because that was a mobilization of the country and uh, right up through uh, the present conflict that uh, uh, they're going to they're going to take care of their own. Um, the uh, the, the veterans organizations today are uh, really involved in uh, uh, taking care of the uh, veterans returning from this conflict. They're, they're developing, they are devoting an awful lot of time to this and uh, it's been helpful. We get, uh, uh, in our organization at Fort Bliss, the uh, Benefits Passional Airborne Chapter, we're, uh, we're very active in, uh, in uh, getting together with the active duty soldiers and uh, we will have some kind of a, a social affair and we'll invite uh, the units to come out and join us and uh, we know the problems that they're having and I think that it is very helpful to them. To, you know, they're, they're, sort of, they're sort of reclusive, you know, they won't just talk to anybody but if they're, if they're talking to a veteran that they know that's experience the same thing that they have, uh, they begin to open up and uh, it, uh, it gives them a good feeling. And it gives us a good feeling to be able to uh, uh, be in contact with these young men. And we do an awful lot of that now. Uh, we, the, the, the one problem we have is more difficult in some cases to uh, uh, establish a rapport with the Vietnam veterans than it is with the present day veterans. We've got some Vietnam veterans that's just, you know, still out of it today. They, they're just reluctant to talk about their experience and, and if, we can, uh, if we can get them in and uh, sort of uh, uh, establish a rapport with them, 
we've had some good results with some of them. We've had some that uh, haven't talked for years, and they come into the organization, and there we are, and uh, they, we, we've experienced the same thing that they have, and now we're talking. So all at once they said, well, you know, maybe this is a, maybe this is a good thing, and they'll come back again. And uh, we've had some we've had some good results that, but the the uh, veterans organizations are doing a pretty good job. Uh, but uh, I think uh, 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 all in all, uh, the, the the military is going to take care of their own, and they do, and they do a good job of it. And what organizations do you specifically work with today? Well, uh, I'm with the. Uh, 82nd Airborne Division Association of Innovators Patterson Chapter in El Paso, and I'm with the Vietnam Veterans of America in El Paso, and I'm with the Purple Heart Chapter in El Paso, I'm with the Disabled American Veterans in El Paso, and uh, I have held offices of all of these. I guess uh, I, and I, I probably spend more time with the uh, Airborne chapter than I do with the others, but I'm active in all the organizations, and I, and I uh, hold office in all those, with the exception of the DAV, I hold office today in those organizations too. And I'm a widower, so it gives me something to do. I sort of enjoy it. It keeps me active. I'm 89 years old. In 2013, um, did you receive some sort of an award, like named an All-American or something? I was named the 82nd Airborne Division All-American of the Year. How did that make you feel? Wonderful. What an honor. Geez, they got 40,000 people to choose from. And why me? I don't know. Uh, Quite a surprise when I was called and said, uh, you're going to be named a second Airborne Division Man, Associate Man of the Year, and I, my goodness. So uh, uh, I went up to Bragg and uh, was presented the award, and I was awed by it. And um, when you were there, did you have uh, occasion to interact with some of the younger military guys today? Yes, I did. Yeah. 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 yeah as a matter of fact, uh, uh, one young man and his wife, the particular, that uh, impressed me. He lost his leg in uh, Iraq, or and uh, he said uh, first he said, uh, uh, "Sir, I'd like to have my picture taken with you." And I said, well, "I'd just be honored to have my picture taken with you." And uh, then I had my picture taken with him. He says. Uh, he said, could you just uh, sit down with me and my wife for a little while and talk to us? Uh, absolutely. And it, it, was, it, was, uh, it was quite interesting. But I had a number of those young men come up and congratulate me. And, and, but this, this one uh, uh, really touched me. And uh, I, I guess it uh, probably helped him and did him some good. I sat down and talked to him, and we had about a 30 minute conversation. If you could, um, if you could reflect on uh, one memorable moment from World War II, your most memorable moment, what would it be? And it could be anything, it could be a funny moment, well, a sad moment. The, the one moment that stays in my memory more than anything else is being shot on my 19th birthday. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. On that road, which you didn't know why you were walking down it. Well, I'm walking down the road in enemy territory. The whole damn platoon, the whole patrol is walking down the road with Kelso Horn as a, as a patrol leader. You don't ever do that. <laughs> I mean, of course, we're supposed to make contact with the enemy. We sure did. <laughs> mission but accomplished mission there. Mission accomplished, yeah. With that. Uh, uh, and people sometimes ask me, what, what, just like you did. I said, gee, it's got to be that on my 19th birthday I was shot the first time. Mm -hmm. Is there anything uh, you would like to add that I didn't ask? No, I think you've been pretty thorough. And I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you. And final question. If, um, is there anything you would like to tell future generations at all? Any piece of advice? somebody from your background, your experience, you have a lot to offer, what would you tell them? I would say, 
learn the history of your country, that that is very important, that you know where we've been and how we got there, and uh, that it is, uh, it is so important because if you don't know the history of your country, uh, you're, just, uh, you're just missing out on a great opportunity. Uh, respect, uh, respect your country and your constitution and all people in your country without regard to race, creed, or religion. Uh, I think if you can do that, that uh, not only will you be a success, your country will be a success. And that's something worth fighting for. That's what we've been fighting for. And um, when you ended your military career, what were you doing? You were what? Uh, I went into ranching. Uh, I had uh, uh, I'd bought uh, two ranches in East Texas, one 121 acres and one uh, uh, 1,827 acres. Uh, I had spent a lot of time with my grandparents in that part of the country and had roots there. Uh, and I, uh, I thoroughly enjoyed it while I was doing it. Uh, just a lot of hard work and uh, not too profitable, but uh, uh, very, very satisfying. Uh, my wife enjoyed it, and we were among uh, we were among a lot of relatives. And hey, it was just uh, boy, just uh, just something that kept you occupied. And uh, if you had something on your mind, you wouldn't have to worry about it. You got to got to worry about feeding those cows. Mm -hmm. But uh, I then uh, uh, I had an opportunity to go into business with my cousin. And he wanted me to take over his El Paso operation. This was a manufacturing of, uh, of uh, industrial wiping cloths and the clothing business. And uh, I uh, incorporated another business while I was there. Had over 100 employees. And uh, it was a good business. And I since sold that. And now my time is occupied by my veterans organizations. I'm still staying active. To some extent, it keeps you young. Certainly. Sounds like a, a life well lived. I'd like to thank you for your service and everything you've done for our country. And I thank you for the opportunity of having uh, talked to you. And thanks for sitting here and answering the questions. Thanks. <clears throat>